I'd like to have everybody turn their cell phones off, please. Thank you. All right, on the lighter side, before we dive into the word, these are actual um, comments that were found in church bulletins, okay? Sometimes they are the comments in the wrong place or whatever, but I think you'll enjoy them. Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will be speaking tonight at Calvary Methodist. Come here, Bertha Belch, all the way from Africa. <laughs> This, this is another one. The sermon this morning Jesus is Jesus Walks on the Water. The sermon tonight, Searching for Jesus. Next one. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husbands. <laughs> the, the peacemaking meeting the peacemaking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to conflict. <laughs> Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. <laughs> Next Thursday there will be tryouts for the choir. They need all the help they can get. Barbara remains in the hospital and needs blood donors for more transfusions. She is also having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of Pastor Jack's sermons. <laughs> the pastor will preach his farewell message, after which the choir will sing, Break Forth the Joy. A bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. The music will follow. <laughs> Eight new choir robes are currently needed due to the addition of several new members and to the deterioration of some of the older ones. Please place your donation in the envelope along with the deceased person you want remembered. Potluck supper Sunday at 5 p.m. Prayer and medication to follow. Low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. <laughs> the eighth graders will be presenting Shakespeare's Hamlet in the church basement Friday at 7 p.m. The congregation is invited to attend this tragedy. <laughs> and the last one, Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church. Please use the large double door at the side entrance. <laughs> Actual imprint. Can you imagine? Now everybody's going to read their bulletins to see if they can catch some. I'm sure Joe puts them in there. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we delight in you tonight, God, and we just thank you, Lord, for your love and the promise of your Holy Spirit and the power of your word. And we just pray, O oh God, that you would anoint the word, O oh God. May it go forth with power and effectiveness that only you can give. In Jesus' name. All right, we are at the end of Romans. I begin it and I be end it. I couldn't believe it. Um, been assigned chapters 15 and 16. But really, in order to do that, it's like kind of jumping right in the middle. So I want to begin tonight at Romans chapter 12. Chapter 12. Chapter 12 is kind of a dividing place in the book of Romans. The first part deals with Paul is telling them what to think, what to believe. And from 12 on, he's telling them what to do. It's the imperatives, what to do. And so this is, the, this is the middle part. He spent 11 chapters to these people in Rome that he'd never met. Although you can tell by the concluding list of people that he sent greetings to that he really got to know quite a few people maybe that had moved to Rome or people that he got to know through the people that had visited there that were part of his teaching team. But anyways, let's take a look at chapter 12. I have a couple versions here. We'll read it from the New King James first. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do be, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The NIV says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We sang, I will worship you to the very end. And I thought, we sang that again and again. Do you mean it? Well, what do you have to do to worship him to the very end? According to Romans 12, you got to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. All of it. That right there is your reasonable, reasonable act of worship. I just thought I'd throw that in. Another little point I want to bring out, although this isn't the body of my presentation tonight, he says, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He doesn't say transform your minds. He doesn't say transform your minds. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. It's like a kid whose mom says, son, I want you to go in and take a shower and you're all dirty clean up for, for supper. So the boy is going to go in and he has to be cleaned. So what does he have to do? He has to go in and put himself under the water and use the soap and he's going to be clean. He will be transformed. And so we can be transformed, be changed. We are actually being transformed and being changed as we renew our minds. Our minds are what are going to, are, are directing everything. So that's a couple little nuggets I wanted to throw in. But many times in my office when the kids, I call you kids, I'm sorry, grandkids, uh, come in to recite that Romans 12:1. Those of you who know that, I'm sitting over here listening, although I'm busy doing second phase work, but you know, I gotta listen. And butt my nose in, of course, but I cringe when they say, I beseech your brethren, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, and they leave out that little phrase by the mercies of God. Ooh. It happened to you, didn't it? Yeah. You know what happens when you leave out that little phrase? Because what follows, remember I told you this is the dividing part of the book, and he now is gonna list all the do's and don'ts that you need to do. If you omit that little phrase, you're gonna find yourself looking at this list of do's and don'ts. Some of you are gonna say, well, God knows I'm not perfect, I'll give it my best try. And some of you are going to say, oh my lands, I'll never be able to do these things. I always mess up. I can't do this. It's too hard. Others of you are going to say, yeah, but, you know, it's, I found out that it's easier to try to get along with people and do things right. I don't like the hassle, so I'll give it a try. Any of that response to that particular verse really is a warning, 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 danger, danger, and a big question mark. Do you really understand by the mercies of God? You see, this was not given to people who want to know what they have to do to be accepted. Let me say it again. This is not directed to people of what you have to do to be accepted by God. It's directed to people who are accepted by God and who then in turn know by the grace of God they're going to become everything God wants them to be for his glory. Big difference. A big difference. But you know, we live in a crazy society. Because the word sin just isn't used. In fact, uh, 
it's going on probably 25, 30 years ago, a man wrote a little book. It's out of print now. I have a copy at home. I meant to bring it. The title is Whatever Happened to Sin? And believe it or not, the guy isn't even a believer. He's just a philosopher that was taking a look at what was happening to our culture. And you know, really, um, the offer of forgiveness means nothing until we are aware of our need for forgiveness. How many know that? Yeah. Oh, big deal, you know? Yeah. It is a big deal. But we live in a culture where it's not a big deal. Things that we know are rebellion against God are labeled an illness, are labeled a symptom of a dysfunctional family. It's an issue. But that word sin is not mentioned. So, you know, what do you mean by the mercies of God? We sing of his mercy and all this stuff, but Paul just spent 11 chapters centering on the mercy of God because he says, and therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, or in view of God's mercy, this is what I want you to do. It's a big deal. You know, I remember not too long ago, I said, you know, God, I pray and I talk to God, and I said, you know, God, you know how much I love you, but, you know, I want to love you more. I, want to, I really want to love you more. I need more of you. Do you know what he did? To make me love him more, he took his big searchlight and went into the deepest crevices of my heart and exposed the filth and the yuck that I had deep within. Deep within. Pride. I'm not going to lay them all off. You guys probably have the same thing. Why did he do that? Because you see, if you don't have a reason to be forgiven, you're not going to appreciate his forgiveness. Yeah. You're not going to understand what it means. You're not getting what you deserve. Because when he shows you who you are, rebellious against the God Almighty, you're going to understand how good he is when you see how bad you are. I hear people say, well, you know, he says, I... I just feel so. I just feel like I'm worthless. I just don't. I'm, I'm not worthy. I, you aren't worth it. You aren't worthy. Right. Let's start with that premise. Let's start with that premise. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter two. Let's pick out a couple verses here that'll build us up to the assigned reading. Let's take a look at Romans chapter two. And let me tell you what happened to me. And I think this might be a lesson that maybe you might try yourself. If you are in a state where you go, well, I don't think I have much sin. What I don't, it, there's nothing, there's not a button there. But I have to also say that the Holy Spirit has to do the work. Amen. But listen to what he says in Romans chapter 2. And let's pick it up at 4. Let me give you a little preface so you know what he's talking about. He has just gone over, we learned it last week in chapter 1, about how bad man is. And he was talking about how he suppresses the truth, he knows it. And then he listed all these different sins. If you think that, well, I'm not as bad as that guy, or I, at least I don't use anymore, or at least I don't do this anymore. Some of the things that label people who are have a lifestyle that is not right with God, including such things as envy, murder, strife, deceit, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Oh, it goes on and on. Unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, all of this. Man, is that your rap sheet? I mean, really, think about it. And the Jews were saying, oh, well, then Paul said, well, wait a minute, let me tell you, you're not any better off. But notice what he says here in verse 4. He says, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? You know, there's a little story about a lady in the olden days who, who had a carriage. 
and she lived in a, um, a nice little house, but the only thing is to get down into the village, there was a real windy road, and she needed a carriage driver. And several men applied for the job. And as part of the application, they had to take her for a ride. And she said, I just want to see, mister, how close you're going to, you can get to that edge. And so the first one gets in, and boy, he maneuvers really carefully. He gets real, almost over. Nope, don't want you. The next guy, Sonny, I want to see how close you can get to that edge. Or will get to that edge. Here he goes, real close, almost, no. The third guy, the third guy, what does he do? He stays way on this side, real safely in the, on the other side of the road. She said, you have the job. So many of us, listen carefully, we want to get to the very edge of what we're doing and think, well, it would wouldn't God, God doesn't care if I do this. Or you'll ask me, is this God's will? And you want to get, what you're actually saying is, can I just do a little bit here, just a little bit in order for me to do this and still be in God's favor? Let's get into the middle of the road. Because look what it says here. When you realize how good God is, it says right here that it's going to lead you to repentance. And you're not going to repent if you don't think you're doing anything wrong. And so you need to say, search me, O Lord, and try me and know my heart. And let me know, God. Because when you realize that and then how good God is, because we all know that mercy is not getting what you deserve. Even Jesus spoke about those are in condemnation already because the light has come into the world and they love darkness rather than light. But my friends, you have been able to receive the imputed. What does the word impute? That means to get something, somebody gives you something and you receive it as if it's your very own. So your sins and all the things that you have done against the Lord were given to Jesus, imputed onto him as if he himself had done all those things. And because he was seen as having done all those things, he received the just penalty, which was hell itself. And in exchange, what did he do? He gave you his righteousness as if it belonged to you. Hallelujah. And so now the books are clean. Hallelujah. It's, 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 it's taken care of. But you know what? Unless the Lord convicts you of wrongdoing, of the ugliness of your heart, you aren't going to have even a desire, a desire for it. So seek the Lord. Realize that all have sinned and come short of the glory yes. of God. Yes. You know, sometimes I think we go right to the little edge. You know why? Because we got a reckless love that will go down the pit and get us up. I can go down there, and if I fall over the edge, hey, I'm down here, Lord. You're going to search me, and you're going to raise me up. Yeah, he is a faithful God, but let's not cheapen his grace. Amen. If you're in a habit of just scooting around, Maybe you don't understand in view of God's mercy. You're maybe grading on a curve. Well, I'm not as bad as this one. I'm not as bad as I used to be. And so my good outweighs the bad, and so I'm okay. No, you're not okay. If I'm okay and you're okay, then what is he doing on the cross? Okay? Okay. All right. Boy, that one burns out pretty good. So that was interesting. Now, I want to show you another thing. Let's take a look at Romans 1.16, one of Pastor Walt's favorite verses. 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, which means the rest of us Gentiles. Well, let's take a look at it. It says, the gospel of Christ. What's the gospel of Christ? I just told you about the gospel of Christ. It was the exchange of our sins for his righteousness. And when we believe and trust that God did that for us, well, that is if you think you need it. Because you cannot receive the gospel without needing a physician. It's like the fire truck that pulls up at the house. And the owners say, oh, no, take care of this. Or the doctor who wants to give the patient a pick in order to get some, some fluids into the body because they're dehydrated. Oh, no, I don't really need that doctor. If you got that mentality, chances are the Holy Spirit has not convicted you of your sin. I pray that the Lord does that. Yes. Because without him convicting your sin, you have no need for a savior. Right. You're content and you like being in the darkness. You like being in the darkness. You might not like the consequences of it, but you like being there. As Jesus had said in chapter 3 of John. But when it says the gospel, but notice what it says here. For it is the power of God to salvation. Now many of you guys think that means, oh, that means I'm getting saved. I'm saved. No, salvation is a process. You can look in the Bible and there's places where it says you will be saved, you are being saved, or you have been saved. It's a process. Power, energy, change, moving. So when you receive the Lord, you receive His Spirit. Yes, in Romans 8 9, those who have the Spirit of Christ are His. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not His. And so you are justified, you're made right, the imputation has been exchanged, you now have His righteousness, you've got the power of His Holy Spirit inside of you. You are being saved, the being saved. It's the Spirit inside of you that's working with you. This is the one that's helping you scrub while you're standing underneath the power Amen. This is this is the how, this is the Holy Spirit is there using the Word of God, showing you what's pleasing to God. And why do you want to do it? In view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy. It's His love that constrains me. Paul says, "Is this unmerited favor I get all the time when I don't deserve it?" That's what going to drive you and say what can I do Lord what is it you want yes. see many of you people have embraced up here but it hasn't gotten here yet. and I just pray that it comes down here you will understand and the Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit that this is truth and this is what we need amen yes. so 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 you're being saved you're being transformed you're being transformed you're becoming sanctified. What's it all about? We're told that the purpose of all this is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's why I like Brother Jack. Bracket Jack is very simple and he tells it like it is. Conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That you are going to become... Why? Why? Because you have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. Which means you don't reflect back to God all of goodness and honesty and purity and all that good stuff. You don't do that because Adam and us, the, the, the image, the mirror has been smashed. Okay? So now that we have Jesus and his spirit inside of us, he's making us more and more like Christ. So now we're reflecting back to the Father. Hey, that's like my son. Call me Abba Father. You're my son. You're my daughter. I see my son in you. And you're becoming more like him. So, you know, you're all excited and, and, and we're on our way. And then we go back to, let's go back to Romans chapter chapter 15 where I was assigned and I just have a few minutes I want to throw some things out. 
chapter 15 of Romans. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. One of the big things that Paul talks about, listen carefully, is that if you are in Christ, and I mentioned it last week, you're in Christ and you're in Christ, that means we all have the DNA of Jesus Christ flowing through our bodies. We come together, we form His body. All right, we are His body. That's why in chapter 12, when after you present your body as a living sacrifice, what does it look like? Well, you're not going to be haughty. You're not going to. Um, you're going to rejoice with those who rejoice, and you're going to be patient, and you're going to have all these good qualities. You're going to love your enemies. Everything that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to do. You're going to do. Not because you have to and hope you get a good return. You do it because of God's mercy. And one of the things is you will become a part of the body. And he's saying, you know, in Rome, the big difference was there were a lot of people in Rome that have a Jewish background. And they're born again. They love Jesus, they got the DNA of Jesus, but they still like to maintain certain rituals of the Jewish, not to be saved. And they, some of them were vegetarians, and some of them made sure they didn't eat anything that was offered to an idol. And Paul, who considers the mature people, could eat them, because they knew that they had no power over him. But, you have to look out for your brother. Let me give you a, a, a good example. Confession time. I don't think there's anything wrong for me to have a glass of wine with my dinner. Walt and I were at the Red Lobster years ago. I was on staff at First Assembly. How many know that First Assembly is First Assembly? You call it the dream city church and um, pastor barnett often would say liquor has not touched my lips and so i knew that the assemblies of god you don't drink okay i didn't feel guilty to have a glass of wine with my fish but you know what i didn't do it why oh i had liberty to do it because I did not want to subject anybody, people of first time, was really large in those days, that I could just believe that somebody would be in there that maybe knows that I belonged up there and I was drinking and I would cause that person to stumble. My husband solved the problem. You know what he did? He said, waitress, get a water glass. <laughs> put some ice in it. Yeah. And put some Chablis in it. How do you know you can? White wine. And I have my little wine with my fish. Now, he won't because he's an alcoholic or was an alcoholic, so he doesn't. But you see what I'm saying? You respect everybody. If you know doing something is going to hurt somebody else, you don't do it. Amen. You don't rub their nose in yeah. it. You don't put them down. You just don't. Do it. You just go do it. Oh, you barber like that one. It says right here, it says, Let each of us, verse 2, please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. You guys, can't you see the mind of Christ in operation? The mind of Christ is not me first. And we live in a crazy society. You know, we were watching that movie this morning on Rome, and I thought, man, that must be rough. There's the emperor, and he thinks he's God, and everybody has to... You know what? Ten foot tall Nero statue here was there, and everybody they were afraid. He he said, "I'm I'm God," and everybody was supposed to worship him. I thought well, that would be terrible. Well, now we've got a big ego statue, and everybody worships their ego, and I think that's even more threatening than having a Nero that we're supposed to be worshiping. Look out for number one. You see, that's still part of old sin nature. We do that around here. If you know somebody's on a diet, how many know as a Christian, 
You don't bring out the piece of pie and eat it right in front of them, do you? You see, that's not thinking. You're always thinking of your fellow men. This is the body of Christ and whatever you do. And I just want to quickly point out two other things. He says, whatever things were... He said, look at verse 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. Why? That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were created, what? For the glory of God. We were created that God would be exalted. And He is going to be exalted in the body of Christ when all the cells are all working together for the good of the whole. You know, cancer cells, we don't want any of that. They're rebellious. They want to do their own thing. The true body of Christ. So what do you do? You view God's mercy yes. every day. Realize where you've been. Realize what you do. Review the day. You know, you forgot to do this or you did this wrong or whatever. Let's call it like it is. Cry out to God. God, I want to love you more. Show me. Show me how I can love you more. And he'll show you where you fall short so that that can move you to appreciate his love and his love will move you to repentance. Amen. And oh, how sweet it is. Yes. Once you have repented for the Lord to say, I love you, Louis, and he draws you closer. Yes. That's the story of Romans chapter 12. Amen. Amen. And to the end. So let's glorify God in our unity. Let's look out for one another. Let's love one another. And let's um, keep in mind God's mercy so that our bodies, as we present a living sacrifice, yes. holy and acceptable to God, not out of obligation, receive it, it's a gift. Closing analogy, Pastor Walt gives me some flowers. It's a gift. I receive them and appreciate them. It's not my opportunity to think, oh my goodness, what did I do right in order to get those flowers? I've got to figure it out what it is so I can do it again so I can get more flowers. Uh -uh. It's not right. It was a gift. I receive it. I don't come back with a bunch of golf balls the next day to, well, you went so good to me. Here's some golf balls. I probably wouldn't buy the right brand anyways. Here, you've been so good to me. You don't pay it back. You don't pay God back. You receive his gift. You receive his gift. Relish his mercy and love one another. Father, we thank you so much, God, for your mercy and your grace that you shower upon us all the time. Help us, oh God, just to focus on you. Help us to understand that the closer we understand your goodness, oh Lord, and repeatedly receive your mercy and grace, that we find ourselves humble before you, God, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, that you might be glorified throughout this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes.